Hello, my name is Claire Hughes. I'm Director of Learning and Teaching and Deputy Head of Department in the Department of Environment and Geography at York. Welcome to the first of our two-part series supported by Ron and Barbara Cook, exploring the biodiversity of the University of York's Campus East development. For those of you unfamiliar with the university's campus, the institution is set across two sites within the village of Heslington. The original campus west site was developed in the 1960s and at the heart of which is the Campus Lake, home to scores of wildfowl and wildlife. In 2010, the university expanded towards the village of Badger Hill, creating an extension to the campus, Campus East, and a larger lake and biodiversity project. I'm delighted to welcome now Gordon Eastham, Grounds Maintenance Manager at the University of York, who will discuss the initial development of Campus East and explain how this special habitat was created. My name is Gordon Eastham and I'm the Grounds Manager for the University of York. Um, my presentation today is, is on the wilding of Campus East. Uh, it's part one of a two-part presentation uh, part two being delivered by uh, my colleague Robin Perutz um, later in the in the programme. Hesington East Campus is approximately 120 hectares or nearly 300 acres in size. Phase one of development began in 2008 and one of the planning conditions placed on the university was to increase the biodiversity of the site through the creation of a variety of different habitats. In practice, this was quite an easy thing to do as prior to development, the land was intensively farmed arable land and thus not particularly biodiverse. We have some information that relates to the current biodiversity of the site, but since a baseline ecological survey carried out shortly after phase one of development was finished in 2011, there has been no other broad spectrum ecological survey undertaken. Our overarching management principles were to preserve where possible existing valuable habitats for example, hedgerows and ditches, and then to create a variety of new habitats and link these to enable species movement between them. Linear habitats such as hedges, ditches and swales are good for this. We time management operations to avoid unnecessary disturbance to wildlife, and we don't overmanage because nature itself does the best job when it comes to habitat creation. We compost as much green waste as we can to reuse on the site and do not automatically default to herbicides and pesticides to affect pest control. This slide conveys the scale of the Campus East development site, bounded by the A64 City Outer Ring Road, two residential areas, Badger Hill and Heslington Village, and the Grimston Bar Park and Ride. Most of the habitat creation measures took place within the peripheral or buffer zone landscape and as such should largely remain unaffected by future development on campus. 
One cannot, however, mention the buffer zone landscape without also talking about topography. A great deal of earth movement took place during phase one of development to help shape the peripheral landscape, but also to achieve the mixing of nutrient rich topsoil with the underlying less fertile subsoil. This process helped to decrease overall soil fertility levels to make conditions more favorable to the establishment of wildflowers and also to mitigate nutrients being leached from the soil into the lake water. Another planning condition placed on the university at the time of development was that no soil could be brought onto or taken off site. These next two slides give context to the soil moving operation. This is a view northeastwards from Low Lane across to Kimberlow Hill. This is a view southeastwards across to the A64 in the distance and shows a formation of the top of the lake. The areas shaded dark green on the plan represent the locations of the woodland blocks which were planted within the peripheral landscape. 15 blocks were planted containing a total of approximately 70,000 trees and shrubs. Woodlands constitute a priority habitat in the UK Biodiversity Action Plan. Woodland blocks have been planted throughout the peripheral landscape on campus east, with each block containing a broad native species range. Where it was possible, the trees were sourced locally and grown within the Vale of York. A mixture of trees and shrubs was intended to provide a multi-layered habitat. A broad range of natives made up the species composition, including the list on this slide. These are the steps in, woodland, in the planting process beginning with root dipping. All the trees planted within the woodland blocks were field grown and lifted during the dormant season and as such were burr roots rather than containerized plants. To help ensure successful take of the trees, before being planted they were dipped in a moisture retention compound, most aptly described as being of a similar consistency to wallpaper paste. This retains moisture around the tree roots helping to prevent desiccation. The trees were then planted using the notch planting tree method. This consists of two spade cuts made at right angles to each other forming a T-shape. The blade of the spade is then pushed into the ground through the bar of the T and when lifted the soil folds apart to form a void large enough to insert the root system of a small tree. 90% of the trees planted were what we call whips and are typically around three to four feet tall. The remaining 10% were slightly bigger feathered trees around five to six feet tall. This is a planting block containing around 5,500 trees immediately following planting. This is a different planting block pictured in the spring subsequent to planting. A success rate of around 90% was achieved with tree growth in phase one. This is the same woodland block pictured from the same location last year. The initial planting blocks are now just over 10 years old. Hopefully over time, the woodland blocks will develop with a diverse herb layer and provide habitat for priority bird and mammal species. Nesting and roosting boxes can be introduced when the trees become big enough and log and brush piles can be created from the wood generated by thinning operations. Pretty much every small tree planted on campus east had a tree shelter put around it. And as such, tens of thousands of shelters were used, which equates to a lot of plastic. Many of the shelters have now served their purpose and we are beginning to, co to collect them up to either reuse or have them recycled by the original manufacturer. We are receiving valuable help with this from both Tremendous, a not-for-profit organization set up to promote and plant trees and supported by City of York Council and by the John Lally International Foundation, which is a charity that carries out environmental improvement works. Even so, there will be several years of work involved in removing all the tree shelters that were originally used. Water-based habitats include lake, ponds and wetlands, reed beds, swales, and the detention basin. This slide gives an indication of the size of the lake on campus east. This photo was taken on the 19th of March, 2010. So how big is the lake? Well, it's considerably bigger than the lake on campus west, and this should help in keeping the water quality in a good state. 
why have another lake? Well, water-based habitats are the richest in terms of biodiversity and water is nearly always a desirable element to have within the landscape as it gives a point of reference. The lake is also an integral part of the campus surface water drainage system, acting as a large balancing pond. Another planning condition placed on the university at the time of development was the discharge rate of drainage water of 1.4 litres per he hectare per second. These were the stages involved in the lake's construction. The lake has a shelved or stepped profile which affords the opportunity to grow a fringe of marginal aquatics around the lake perimeter. This slide shows excavation works underway at the western end of the lake. The form of the lake now is beginning to take shape. Here a roll of bentonite liner is being manoeuvred into position. Once in position, the edge of the lining is buried to secure it. Once in place, an overburden of sand about 300 millimetres thick both protects the liner and provides an inert medium into which to plant marginal aquatics. We have tried to make sure the water quality in the Campus East Lake does not decline over time as it has on Campus West. We have made the lake deeper to try and limit bottom sediment disturbance. There has been no stocking with fish. Any fish presently in the lake have found their way in naturally. It is expected that a natural balance of species and numbers will be achieved because of this. The lake has an integral circulation and filtration system. It has more marginal and aquatic plants and we have sunk a boat borehole to the underlying Sherwood aquifer to give us the option of topping up water levels in times of drought. We also employ a nutrient management regime consisting of several elements. We will now take a look at these elements individually. Management problems associated with lowland lakes are often a result of nutrient enrichment. This slide is of a watercourse linked to the lake on campus west and shows a bloom of blue-green algae. Lakes with a 40% cover of higher plants will have a greater chance of having clear water. This is because algal blooms are reduced through shading and uptake of nutrients by floating aquatics. They also provide a refuge for zooplankton, which in turn graze on phytoplankton. These are all elements of a balanced ecosystem. Species of fish such as these carp pictured in the lake on campus west are not good for the ecology of shallow urban lakes. As bottom feeders, they continually recycle nutrients through disturbance of sediments and they graze heavily on zooplankton, removing a natural control on phytoplankton. As already noted, the mixing of nutrient-rich topsoil with the less fertile underlying subsoil helps to, de to decrease overall soil fertility levels, which should help to reduce the amount of nutrients leaching from the soil into the lake water. The circulation system within the lake sends water through a reed bed filtration system where the Norfolk reed acts as a biofilter. Cutting the species rich grassland and taking it as a hay crop every year should systematically deplete nutrients within the soil, again leading to a reduction of nutrient leaching into the lake water. Goose feces can be a large contributor to nutrient loadings within the lake water. The more geese, the greater the potential loading, so we employ various cultural methods to try to discourage a high goose population. And this was the first wildfowl sighting on the lake. 6th of September 2010 was the date when the filling of the Campus East Lake officially began with the switching on of the borehole pump. We had a little ceremony to celebrate, hence the cake. You may recall the earlier slide showing the physical size of the lake, which was dated 19th of March, 2010. This shows a water feed from the borehole pump into the eastern end of the lake shortly after being switched on. This is the main body of the lake, partially filled, viewed east to west.
and this is the main body of the lake partially filled looking east. And this is the upper section of the lake as it is today. This is a view across the centre of the lake from south to north. Since the completion of the lake, turn rafts and martin boxes have been introduced to provide additional nesting and breeding potential on and close to the lake. The wetland area to the southwest of the lake was originally intended to be a collection of permanently wet pools and seasonally wet scrapes. Unfortunately, the wetlands have not developed as originally intended and are now one homogeneous body of water. This may be a limiting factor in terms of its habitat potential. We perhaps should add amphibians to this list of objectives, but not having seasonally wet pools may limit their potential colonisation, with particular reference to newts. This is the wetland area under construction. The wetland pools were never lined, but this has not prevented them from filling and retaining water. This is the wetland area partially filled. This sluice links the wetland area to the upper lake and was incorporated to allow the wetland area to be topped up with water should it be necessary. It has never been opened though. This is the wetland area shortly after it had filled completely. And this is how the wetland area looks now, well in summer at any rate. Dozens of orchids now colonise the margins of the lake and wetlands, including marsh and common spotted orchids. The detention basin was originally supposed to be an area of flood meadow or ings. However, since it was formed, it has remained permanently wet. The water within the basin is not deep and the vegetation around it has colonised naturally. There is very little management intervention and it is a good example of what nature does when left to its own devices. The detention basin during construction. The stone channel through the middle was meant to carry the Badger Hill surface water drain into the lake. Once completed, the basin soon started to fill with water. The detention basin is an accidental piece of habitat, but a valuable one nonetheless, and a demonstration of how nothing can do a better job than nature itself. The reed beds themselves are a mass planting of Norfolk reed, which acts as a biofilter for the lake water but they also make an excellent habitat for species such as this reed warbler. The swales on campus these form part of the surface water drainage system and their design varies in response to the anticipated water volumes they carry. They also provide a naturalistic landscape element between the buildings that links to the peripheral landscape. They can be good habitats for moisture loving plants, invertebrates and small mammals. This slide shows the establishment of the swales within the curtilage of the Goodrick College accommodation blocks. The swales become deeper and are more likely to be permanently wet as they move towards a peripheral landscape. Species rich meadows are another prominent habitat on campus east, comprising several hectares of land. They provide foraging for pollinators, habitat for invertebrates and nesting opportunities for birds such as skylarks. To create the conditions necessary for wildflowers to establish and thrive, deep ploughing was carried out to bring low fertility subsoil to the surface. The draft on this plough was three feet and takes a very large tractor to pull it through the ground. Once at the surface, the subsoil is harrowed to produce a seed bed and is then over sown with a wildflower seed mix. Nearly 10 years on and some of the meadowland areas become a carpet of yellow 
as tens of thousands of cowslips flower in spring. These in turn are followed by a succession of perennial wildflowers such as red campion, oxeye daisy, knapweed, ladies bed straw and bird's foot trefoil. The wildflower meadowlands are cut and baled in late summer. This is later than most farmers would take a hay crop, but it gives the wildflowers ample time to set seed and for birds to finish nesting. Cornfield annuals can make a spectacular display, but they need the ground to be cultivated annually for them to grow. As such, it is only feasible to have small areas of annual flowers, usually in high profile areas for maximum impact. This routine has to be repeated every year to achieve a display of annual wildflowers. There is a large area of campus east that is given over to naturalistic scrubland in which there is as little disturbance or management intervention as possible. Access to this area of campus, which is on the south side of the lake, is actively discouraged as it is intended to be a sanctuary for nature. To conclude, it is relatively easy to introduce target flora through sowing or planting, but if conditions are not favourable, they will soon disappear, and animal species will only colonise if the habitat suits them. Habitats will evolve over time, and more species are likely to colonise, but some may also move out. The primary objective should be to optimise the potential of habitats in an effort to attract the broadest range of biodiversity. And finally, the mention of West Campus. Some of the slides in this presentation were taken on, on Campus West, but mainly to demonstrate undesirable characteristics. However, there are several positives in terms of habitat and biodiversity, not least the extensive bee orchid colonies that have manifested themselves over the last decade, decade or so. There are also several woodland areas that provide excellent habitat for a range of bird species. In comparison to Campus East though, the water quality of the lake on Campus West is not good and action is needed to address this. Part of the issue is the proximity of buildings to the water and it is highly desirable that we do not allow buildings to encroach on the lake on Campus East over time. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. It is the first in the two part series. The second event in the series, Wild in Campus East, the Thriving Habitat, will take place on Monday 14th of June and be presented by Professor Robin Perrotts, after which there will be an opportunity for discussion and question and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon, for this absolutely fascinating insight into the beginnings of the Campus East Habitat. Why not sign up now for the second event in this series, which features a talk by Robin Perrotts of the University of York's Department of Chemistry. In his talk, Robin will look at the variety of species found on Campus East and the educational and research opportunities it provides. Afterwards, he'll be joined by Gordon for a discussion and Q&A. Campus East is open to all, and we know many local residents and members of the university community enjoy taking their daily exercise there. We'd love to see any wildlife photos or videos that you have taken while visiting. Why not share them on social media using the hashtag, hashtag YorkIdeasWilding, or email them across to us to share. <laughs>